Gun Show. Hello. Have you ever noticed how easy it is for us to dismiss a silly someone else's fears? Of a mouse, for instance. Well, it seems such a small, unimportant thing to be frightened of, and yet... I have seen women climb up on a chair and actually scream with fright at the sight of a mouse. Silly? Well, maybe. Right now, I'd like you to meet Lyman T. James, M.D. This story is true. Within the limits of our ability, it is an authentic portrayal of an actual case history. We have, of course, changed the names, initials, and certain other things which might possibly identify or embarrass those involved. We will call the young lady in this case, Mary G. Hello, Mother. Mary. Uh, yes, I've already been to the office and I've signed all the papers. That's right. But what I called you about was... Mother, can you hear me? I'm going to the tennis matches, so I won't be home. Mother... I can't hear, there's so much noise. What? Oh, that's right, that's right. I'm going to the tennis matches. And I'll be home for a very long time. Let me out! Let me out! Mary's secret. The one thing she wanted to hide from the young attorney she had just met. The one thing she tries to hide from the world. She has a morbid and terrifying fear of close confinement, commonly referred to as claustrophobia. I'm... I'm sorry to have embarrassed you that way. You must think I'm crazy. Oh, don't be silly. Why would I think you're crazy? I might as well tell you the truth right now. And so, shortly after she met him for the first time, Mary told the young attorney about her peculiar affliction, her morbid, uncontrollable fear of close confinement, of small rooms and narrow passageways, of elevators and telephone booths. Somehow in a telephone booth, it's, it's not so bad if I leave the door open. It's silly, isn't it? You know, I can sit right here and, and reason that it's silly and to know that it is. Know it better than anybody, and yet I... I can't help it. <laughs> I'm, uh, glad you can't help it. It's sort of cute. Saves a lot of time. Saves a lot of time. Why, <laughs> sure. We could have spent weeks before we reached the point where I could take in my arms. This way, I, uh, push in a phone booth, boom! Right back into my arms. <laughs> Oh, you take it too seriously. Come on, we're going to tennis matches. We'll stop along the way and make a phone call to your mother without some, some moron playing that jukebox. Come on. All right, get my bag. <laughs> so they went to the tennis matches that afternoon, and they had fun. And in the months that followed, they did many things together in the big, wide, wonderful world that isn't all chopped up into confining rooms. Here, they could almost forget about elevators and phone booths and irrational fears. And when they did encounter those things, Tom merely teased her in fun, for he was a young man in love, and nothing else seemed very important. They were married the following spring and moved into a lower flat on West 53rd. Apparently, there was nothing very dramatic or unusual about the first two years of their marriage. A fine couple, still very much in love but each endowed with a fair share of human frailties. It's been a long time now since Tom has teased his wife about her obsession. It's been a long time since he's thought of it as cute. Well, look, I don't know why you went up to look at it in the first place. You knew it was out of the question. It's on the 10th floor, and I can't walk up and down 10 flights of stairs maybe two or three times a day. I just can't do it. There's an elevator in the building. Oh, dear, you know, I, I can't ride in an elevator. What are we going to do? Live in an old dump like this the rest of our lives? I tell you, I was actually embarrassed when Mr. and Mrs. Tibbetts came by Sunday. Well, it's not that I'm in love with this place, you know, but it... 
It is on the ground floor, and at least I don't feel like my heart's in my mouth all the time. Yeah, I know, but let's face it. We're never going to find a modern apartment and a rundown walk-up, a big kitchen, a bathroom as big as a bedroom. They don't build them like this monstrosity anymore. Oh, Tom, please, sit down. Sit down and let's just talk without getting angry or storming out, shall we? Talk. That's all we ever do is just talk about it. Look, honey, it's not that I care so much. Honey, you know that. It's just that I want to get ahead in the world so, so you can have things. I know. I know, dear. A lawyer has got to meet people. Make a good impression. If you want clients to have confidence in you, you've got to look successful. I know, but... Oh, what's the use? We've been over it so many times. I'm sorry, Tom. I don't know what else I can say. This isn't what you say. It's what you do. Confounded, you can get rid of this crazy fear of yours if you just put your mind to it. But I can't. You know I can't. Yes, you can. You just haven't ever forced yourself. That's all. But I have. I've tried, and I can't. I'm... I want to tell you something. When I was a boy, I was afraid of horses. I guess I was just about as afraid of them as you are of elevators. You know what my dad did? No. He made me get on a horse and ride. Sure, I was scared. I don't mind telling you I was scared. Sitting up there on top of that horse, I was like sitting on top of a mountain. I screamed and I cried, but my dad made me ride, and I wasn't afraid of horses after that. Yes, but you're different, Tom. You're not like me. You don't realize... I realize that. one thing. If we don't whip it, it's going to whip us. It's gone far enough. I can't whip it. I've tried, and I Honey, can't. do you trust me? Of course I trust you. You know I do, but... All right. We'll go down to the office on Sunday. I'll get a key, and we'll have the whole building to ourselves. I know just what we're going to do. We're going to whip this thing once and for all. Now look, honey. You want to whip it, don't you? You know it's foolish. Nothing can hurt you. I'll be right in there with you. I won't let anything hurt you. Oh, sure you can. We'll ride up and down a few times, you'll see nothing can hurt you, and you won't ever be afraid again. Let's go home. Mary! I'm not gonna back down now. You walk into that elevator, I'll carry you in. I mean it. You wouldn't. You just think I wouldn't. Now, you walk in, or I'll carry you. That's half the battle. Nothing's gonna hurt you. I'm right here with you. After that terrifying experience in the elevator, that Mary and Tom G. finally sought psychiatric help. I, uh, I reminded them that a psychiatrist is a lot like a plumber in this respect. His biggest job may be that of repairing the damage done by folks who bungle the job themselves first. Well, I, I certainly didn't think I was doing anything wrong, Doctor. You see, uh, that's the way my father cured me of my fear of horses. He made me get on a horse and ride. Doctor? Uh, do you think maybe it might have worked if I hadn't fainted? Oh, we can start out with a lot of fabulous theories. But by the time we get them all boiled down to where we begin to understand them, we, well, we find there's not very much left except a little old-fashioned common sense. But w where's the common sense in this case? W what I mean is, does it make any sense at all to be as terrified as I am of being... We're closed in. Well, now, tell me this. Did you ever hear the saying, the burnt child fears the fire? Yes. 
Does that make sense to you? Y yes, naturally. Well, you see, we can say the same thing in a lot of different ways. The bitten child fears the dog. Mm -hmm. The kicked child fears the mule. The, the whipped child fears the strap. Y yes, I understand all that. Well, a lot of things happen to us as we go along through life. Some of them are unpleasant. We develop little fears and inhibitions. Warn us not to make the same mistake over again. It's a little, a little inner warning. Don't get yourself into that situation again. But, Doctor, that isn't true in my case. I mean, nothing ever happened in an elevator. I, I, I was just plain scared of the first elevator I ever saw. I remember how I felt when the man started to close the doors. It's awful. I, I, I was so frightened I, I couldn't stand it. You weren't born with this fear of close confinement. I wasn't? No. That's one thing we know for sure. Somewhere along the way, something happened. But what was it? When did it happen? How did it happen? Where did it happen? Somewhere there's a simple, logical explanation. All we have to do is find it. It's a remarkable, God-given blessing, our ability to put our thoughts into words. It helps us to understand each other, and oddly enough, it helps us to understand ourselves. You know, there's one thing I noticed looking back over my notes. You never mentioned your father. Oh, well, my father died when I was quite young, Doctor. Oh, well, how young? Mm, eight, nine... Uh, I, I think it was around nine. Eight or nine, hmm? No. No, I think it was eight. Anyway, my mother would know. Well, even if you were only eight, you should remember him pretty well, hmm? Oh, I remember him. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. What kind of a man was he? Tell me about him. Oh, he, he was a fine man, my father. Hmm? He, uh... He ran a restaurant supply house, and he worked very hard all of his life. Never got into any kind of trouble, and he made good money. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of a man was he personally? Oh, he was very honorable. Very. Uh, quite strict, too. In fact, he was, uh, he was quite a stickler for honesty and integrity. It took quite a bit of patient prodding but she began recalling various things about her father, incidents she hadn't thought about for years, and each one helped to remind her of something else. Then, finally, after many interviews... Yes, that's right. And uh, speaking of my cousin, Bobby, I... I remember the night he was born. My mother had gone over their house to fix dinner, and she'd left dinner for us, as for my father and me in the oven. And Well, after dinner, I decided to do the dishes and surprise her. Nothing broke, Daddy. Not any at all. Wow, it sounded like you'd broken every dish in the house. But I did look. That's no excuse for dropping them, though, young lady. Just absolute carelessness. enough. What have I told you about being truthful? But I didn't break it. Young lady, I'm going to teach you to tell the truth if it's the last thing I ever do. But it is the truth, and Daddy. You can just stay in there until you're ready to tell me the truth, too. But it is the truth, Daddy. I didn't break it. You can scream all you want to. I'll be back in 45 minutes. We'll see if you're ready to tell the truth then. Please, Daddy. Mary, if you're ready to tell the truth, I'll let you out now. All right. Tell Daddy you're sorry that you forgot to tell the truth. But it is the truth, Daddy. Please believe me. 
I didn't break the disc. But you did break it. You know you did. I heard you break it. I don't care. I didn't. I didn't. Now you listen to me. Until you have learned to tell the truth, you're not going to get out of there. Do you understand? You can just stay in there and rot. <laughs> Is that it, Doctor? Is that where it started? My, my fear of being closed in? Now, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Oh. How long did you stay in that closet? Oh, I don't know. My mother came home and let me out. Must have been hours later. She explained that she'd broken the dish and put it in the garbage can. Is there any more to it? No. No, that's all. Isn't that funny? I haven't thought about that in years. All right, now, Mary. Let's have the rest of the story now that we've come this far. There isn't any more, Doctor. I already told you that. Just think. One little misunderstanding, one broken dish, and it could mess up a whole life. It wasn't just a misunderstanding or a broken dish. Not really. You felt guilty about something, didn't you? No. Why should I? Well, that's a good question. Tell me, what did your father say after your mother came home and explained that she'd broken the dish? Well, what could he say? He, he was embarrassed, of course. Did he say that he was sorry? Did he ask you to forgive him, perhaps? Well, I don't know. I suppose he did. I, I don't remember exactly. Try to remember. I remember my father's words when he wouldn't let me out of the closet. You can stay in there until you rot. I remember thinking, what would it be like to rot? How long would it take? And I remember touching my face to, to see if I'd started to rot. Did he say that he was sorry? Did he ask you to forgive him, perhaps? I, I don't know. I suppose he did. I, I really don't know. Try to remember. All right, Doctor. I, I, I suppose he did say he was sorry. I, I don't see what difference it makes. I'm afraid it does make a difference, though, Mary. Maybe you weren't willing to forgive your father right then. Maybe you stored up a little bit of resentment to gnaw at secretly. Isn't that how it was? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, Doctor. Why, why do you keep harping at it? I keep harping at it because it's important. How old were you when this happened? I don't know. About how old? I don't know. I already told you I don't know. I don't want to talk about it anymore, Doctor. Why do you keep on talking about it? All right, Mary, now calm down. Take it easy. There's nothing to become upset about. Please, just be calm. How long was this before your father's death? Oh, please don't. <laughs> please don't. Please. All right, now, Mary, please don't get upset. It's quite all right. This was just a few days before he died. It was about a month before he died. You said something to him you were ashamed of later. No. You? No, Doctor, it wasn't anything I said that I was... You see, he came in and he sat down in my bed and he was talking to me. And I, I, I didn't want to look at him because I knew if I did... If I did, I, I couldn't stay mad at him. And, and, so, and so I just turned over. And I wouldn't kiss him goodnight. <laughs> that was the first time I'd ever done that in my whole life. I see. And then he just got up and walked out of the room. I felt sorry for him. He was all alone. And I wanted to call him back, but I wouldn't let myself. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, that? yes, I understand. Yeah. And then, after he was dead, you used to think about that, hmm? That's... 
just the way I remember my father. All alone, walking out of my room. With tears in his eyes because I wouldn't kiss him goodnight. His own daughter, like his own daughter. There, there, now, it's all right. <laughs> just a misunderstanding about a broken dish. It was a trauma. A, an emotional earthquake. The burnt child fears the fire, remember? And this was your inferno. Yeah, yeah I know. My, my fear about the being in the closet and all. I... It wasn't just fear alone. Mary, there are hundreds of thousands of us who don't like to be confined. Who ask one thing of the world. Don't fence me in. We don't like to be tied down or backed into a corner. When something like that happens, we, most of us, feel a, a mild discomfort. With you, it was a trauma. Doctor, what is a trauma? Well, it's sort of like a piece of plywood that gathers strength from so many different emotions at cross grain, all pressed together. Different emotions? What do you mean, Doc? There was fear, all right. But that isn't all. There was anger, also. There was resentment, rebellion. And then later on, there was shame. You mean, because I wouldn't kiss my father goodnight? Because you wouldn't tell him that you forgave him. Because you purposely clung to your resentment, nourished it, fed upon it. And then, after he was dead, you never quite forgave yourself. You felt guilty and ashamed. I see. Mary, nearly always there's a sense of guilt. Is there? It seems to be the, the glue that holds the plywood together. Doctor, do you mean that if I had kissed him and forgiven him, I wouldn't have had any reason to feel guilty or ashamed all these years? That's exactly what I mean. But it's such a little thing. Is it a little thing, though, forgiveness? Sometimes I think it's the biggest thing in the world. You don't necessarily cure a cold by figuring out where and how you caught it. And you don't automatically abolish a neurosis by discovering how it all started. And yet at that point, you're well on your way. There came a day when she was able to enter an elevator, aided by nothing but willpower and self-knowledge. Mm-hmm, there she is, riding from the first floor up to the second floor of the Wyndham building. People rubbing shoulders with her, and not one of them can even guess that this is the triumphant moment of her life. No man on the first voyage of Columbus displayed more courage than this. Is a man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth the heart shall fall into mischief. It's from the Old Testament. Well, good night. See you next week.